So I'm here to talk about Filecoin, and I want to talk about why we are building Filecoin. This is a talk that where I want to dive into a bit of the ethics and morality behind why we need decentralized storage networks. So as a quick intro to the talk, uh, you should think of this as part of a larger series where we are explaining to the world why, what Falcon is, how it works, and why it's there. So this talk is the why in the long-term motivation type of sense. Uh, as I was writing it, though, there it turns out there is so much to say that in, in 14 minutes, it'll be hard to pack all of the, or hard to unpack all of the ideas. So consider this as a sampling of the types of things that we're thinking about and the types of reasons why it's important to think about these kinds of problems. And perhaps in a, in a future moment, I'll dive deep into you know, a two through three hour long, uh, long haul discussion of why this matters. Uh, a lot of this stuff is, is re uh, relevant to uh, Blockstack as well. Uh, because specifically, the digital identity and digital self pieces, one of the key things that Blockstock is about is giving you ownership of your data. And that is uh, one thing that we, sh one value that we share. And hopefully, I'll articulate why. And a lot of this will translate and will support the, that set of projects as well. So I think. Uh, there's a whole set of other talks as well about IPFS. I won't go into what IPFS is. And if you are interested in the technical aspects of Filecoin, uh, check out the, the papers. Uh, if you're interested in the economic aspects, check out the, this long primer. And uh, as a quick funnel narrowing down, let's start super broad and talk about uh, our civilization as a computation civilization. Let's talk about uh, a, the decentralized revolution that's, gonna, that's happening. I'll introduce our, our stack briefly, and I'll, I'll um, cover a little bit of what Falcon is, just enough so that you understand why these ethical questions matter. We are fundamentally extremely different than what our ancestors were like. Uh, in the last 100 years, we've unlocked computation, and this has, is al has already transformed our species irreparably, basically, or rather for, for the better, but hopefully. Uh, and so pretty much how we operate as humans is having less and less to do with what our ancestors did. And so we have to think very carefully about the properties of the things we use and how we communicate and so on today, because it's fundamentally different to what your intuitions will tell you. Uh, today, you depend on the internet infrastructure of the, of the planet much more than you perhaps understand. And if, if you don't believe me, try, try doing one day without planning it at all, just decide it on the spot, to not do anything that touches the internet at all. And I challenge you to do that, because it'll teach you a lot about how much you depend on these pieces and why, they're, uh, why the data collection that's going on is potentially concerning and why the reliability that isn't quite there um, is also concerning. In the last few years, we've seen this massive um, and this is a very old slide. This is like a three-year-old slide. Uh, there's been this massive uh, effort to decentralize a ton of stuff. Uh, we're very lucky to be part of this. And we, the stack that we're building is around thinking about decomposing peer-to-peer -peer networks from what it means to model data and have distributed uh, systems, what, it, what does it mean to have a distributed web. Uh, and then finally, this protocol Filecoin sits on top of all of the other things we've been, we've been building to create a decentralized storage network. And the goal here is to make it so that you can own your data, but furthermore, so that your applications and your programs can just store data on the network, and they don't have to think about hiring specific parties. And, and it's that stop hiring specific parties thing that really matters here. Uh, all of these, these projects are, are um, part of a larger uh, set of efforts, protocol labs. Uh, is the organization that started to uh, support these. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. Blazing fast Filecoin overview. Consider there, there is a network that has clients and miners. Clients want storage, miners provide the storage, and we use the network as a mediator. Files and, and money flow uh, to, the, uh, to the miners. The miners store files and over time prove to the network that they're storing those files. The network over time releases money to the miners. And so clients must be able to trust the network to preserve the data. The network, this is kind of like this virtual concept, the network isn't any party specifically, it's just simulated. 
the network can't, though, trust the miners. The miners could be malicious or could be just rational. And so if they have a strong incentive to cheat, they will. Uh, furthermore, you can't actually trust the clients either because they may be or be colluding with miners to try and earn additional rewards. So you have any kind of incentive structure here um, that makes it possible for clients and miners to collude uh, in, in a um, successful way, then you, you, have a, you have a problem. We use a blockchain to manage this, this protocol, and we uh, use markets to try and drive the price of storage down and to, make, uh, to, to incent uh, low latency retrieval. There's a whole bunch of interesting tech that came out of this. Won't talk about it here. Uh, and just think about it this way. If, if you think of Bitcoin and the massive um, amount of hardware around the planet that got organized thanks to the, this great incentive structure of the block reward, think of doing that to hard drives. So imagine that uh, you know, when, when you think of Bitcoin consuming more than many country, countries' worth of electricity in mining Bitcoin, uh, and all of that is wasted. Think of that, that horrible, horrible waste. Now imagine if we did something actually useful with those computations in addition to securing the chain. And that's what Falkland's about. It's about creating a storage uh, consensus, a useful storage consensus. The mission of Falcoin is to create a decentralized, efficient, and robust foundation for humanity's information. And each of these words is, it means a whole bunch of stuff. Right? So you can think of decentralization, and there's tons of projects that, that talk about it. It won't go into it. Efficiency here is key. If you don't make these things efficient, nobody will use them. Uh, robustness uh, is a key property that uh, we would argue the current set of systems uh, are robust to certain sets of attacks, but not robust to a lot of others. Uh, and the, the last thing is you know, we really think of this as, a, as creating a foundational layer for computing where we as a species could just trust that our data is stored and backed up by the rest of the world without having to trust any individual parties, without having to trust um, them to not leak our data, to not steal our data, to not um, lose our data, and so on. That's where we're heading towards. So it's hard to get there. And so uh, previously, I've talked about you know, these kind of sets of pro problems uh, that Falcon addresses, and we'll, we'll dive into them a, a little bit. But there's, there's a bunch more that I wanted to touch on today. Uh, you know, in, in these, part of the goal here is, is we need to create a network that uh, incorporates these different sets of parties and do something useful with them. We want to decentralize. Um, the, the addressing of the content so that human names can map to, uh, human readable names can map to, to cryptographic identifiers, and in that way uh, prevent any single party from like, naming and owning your data. Today we have a highly centralized cloud where there's effectively three major storage providers that are storing your stuff. And if uh, they are malicious, uh, then that's you know, pretty problematic. But, you know, Theoretically, they're not actually malicious, they're, they're just rational. And so as long as uh, it's profitable for them to just keep storing your data, honestly, they will do so. But that's, that's a fine balance. What happens when their business models change dramatically and suddenly this isn't any more um, a useful thing for them to do? Or what happens when there's a very strong rational pressure for them to do something that runs counter to your values? Uh, like what happens when they have um, if they're effectively based on some jurisdiction in, in, a, in a legal OS, effectively. And then there are parties that can just compel them to do certain things. That's, a, that's kind of an issue. There's also questions around how much can these parties optimize. Uh, there are certain areas uh, of this you know, high dimensional optimization space that perhaps even these players can't get to. And so the goal is to create a market where, that can exploit those, those pieces of, of optimization. And uh, the a, a big thing here is think about creating a, an incentive structure that allows uh, parties all around you to be able to provide that storage for you if it makes sense for them to do so. So today, if you wanted to, if you had a whole bunch of hard drives and you wanted to store them close to a large group of people, like there's a lot of us here today, uh, it would actually be pretty infeasible to try and start up a local storage provider to try to do that. That's just not how the network works. So when, when we think about computation and, and its development over, over, over time, let's remember that code is data. And there's a, there's, a lot wrapped in, uh, there's a lot of meaning wrapped into this phrase, but the thrust of this is that 
all of our software that we're, that we're now be melding with, all of this software is ultimately having to be stored somewhere and having to compute over a whole bunch of data that is stored somewhere. And so the properties of those pieces uh, have drastic implications on whether or not you can use things. Um, recently, there was this, this uh, you know, big scare in, in Hawaii when, when, when uh, uh, this alert, alert went out that potentially there were uh, missiles headed to, to Hawaii. Uh, and can you, can you imagine people's reaction to that alert in that moment? Uh, now, can you also imagine the reaction that immediately after that, they started, everybody started messaging their family, and in a bunch of, I've heard anecdotal accounts, I haven't verified this, uh, that in several places, just the internet wouldn't work, and, and networks were pegged, and suddenly you're, you're, you're imagining like your, your state of mind, you have just been informed that potentially your, uh, your location is gonna be nuked, and you can't, you're trying to message your family, and you can't do that. And, and just simply because of the load or some other set of problems. So it's very important that the, that the network continues to work on, under a whole bunch of conditions, of extreme conditions that we're not quite um, prepared for on, an, on a normal uh, basis. And it's important that, that, that there are strong rational incentives for, for the, the set of parties around the world to provide that. And today, the, the current rational incentives for the big cloud providers are just not there uh, for, for that, that kind of... Um, that kind of thing. Another thing that I'll mention is, think of all the social networks and all of the data that they're gathering uh, and creating these huge, massive piles of, of information. What happens when one of those, those disappears? Like, sometimes they get shut down and you get a message saying, hey, migrate all of your content. What if you actually liked using that application? Why can't you keep it? I mean, think about tools that you buy that are physical, things like hammers, things like scissors, and so on. The hammer company can't come to your house and say, guess what, we're, we're changing our business model and we're gonna have to recall all these hammers because you rented them from us. And uh, th that's just not how um, humans tend to intuitively interact with their tools. And so we need to move to a, a world where software tools themselves um, behave more like physical tools, where once you give somebody a, this power, this like, amazing superpower based of software, uh, they can keep it as long as they want and they can continue using it as long as they want. Um, and especially if they, if they can store their own data and they can, if they can pay for those costs and so on, then things should potentially be fine. The other set of issues here is when you think of all these social networks and the data they're gathering, consider just how much vital information about people uh, they have in these massive troves of information that is not encrypted at rest. Or, or if it's encrypted at rest, they have the keys, so, so they and parties that hack into them or compel them can get to all that information. And, we're here in Berlin today, where not that long ago, people used census records to track down people who were of a certain heritage to hunt them down. Think of, think of the information that's in these social networks. Think of what's on Facebook and so on. And, and if any party, for whatever reason, gained some kind of totalitarian control again and was able to compel these, these entities to give them, to hand them, massive troves of these personal data they've collected. Think of what a problem we would have, right? So, so th the goal here is try to apply levers so that we can get to building applications that are encrypting data such that only the participants who created that data and, the, and those they explicitly share that data with can decrypt it and can view it. This is hard. This is really, really, really hard. There's a whole bunch of uh, side channel attacks and so on that people have to guard, and the UX is a nightmare and so on. But if we don't do this, what we've built over the th last three years are the tools of the totalitarian state. If they, if, and there's, like, the keys are on the table. And it's just waiting for some uh, you know, government that fails to prevent the rise of something like that again to then empower a group of, of people uh, with a, an incredible amount of control over, over humans. And this isn't so crazy to think about, or like this isn't so far away if you've noticed what happened in the US with the election, and if you no noticed how people were using social media advertising and trigger, social triggers to drive behavior. And so this kind of manipulation is already going on. The, the, kind, the propaganda machine is there, and people are taking advantage of it. And, and you know, people are arguing that this is the tip of the iceberg of what could potentially be, be happening in the future. I think it's the tip of the tip of the iceberg. I think we're, we're barely even coming to understand what this new media that we're making and that we've made over the last three years is gonna, is gonna do to us. And so I think it's very critical that right now we take the, the time where, where things are still very peaceful and so on 
to secure the internet as much as possible, to secure our data, to secure our applications, to make sure that people's information don't, doesn't end up in the, in the wrong hands and so on. Uh, so there's a lot there. This, I, I told you there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, I'll, I'll go to something, something lighter, like data loss. Like, hey, a lot of the internet disappears, and you know, links break. And it's actually extremely hard to archive everything, and the Internet Archive is trying to do so. Uh, but then there's this additional problem that over time, software uh, erodes and fails, and then it's very difficult to, to actually summon it again. And like we mentioned, some of these, these fail. Uh, oh, and hey, hey, by the way, sometimes there's entire societies that decide to burn everything to the ground. And so that can happen too. And so the goal when, when we say we want to build a foundation for humanity's information is something where imagine being able to build a library that, that no party can decide to burn, that no group can come by and say, Let's, we're going to wipe out this entire section of, of, of information. And we think it's important that uh, we also are very careful about what kind of personal data we decide to keep forever. Right now, who knows what is being kept? All of your conversations, all of your email, and so on. Maybe we should be keeping that for your personal use. Maybe we shouldn't. These are questions that, that we're not asking ourselves enough. Uh, there's a whole set of questions around how hard it is to hire storage. And this is also why we're building Falcoin. But I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just <clears throat> describe that it's, it's, it's actually quite difficult. You have to have a legal entity. You have to have a, a, be either a person or a corporation. You have to have a credit card and so on. Programs can't easily hire storage in the network. Um, most people around the planet can't easily hire storage in the network. They can sort of steal storage in the network, but not, not hire it. So it would be useful to be able to do this with just cryptocurrency. Uh, and the last thing I'll mention, because time is, time is short, is a digital self idea. So today, all of this information that's being gathered about you is not just data that's around you. It's part of who you are. Your digital self is a representation of you that is living in computers now. And it's, it's not really intelligent. It's just kind of information. But it's, you think it's not affecting people? It, it actually is. All of those writings continue to voice your thoughts. Your, your writings continue to voice your thoughts. Your, your video recordings continue to talk to people and so on. And, and all of those pieces, you currently don't, don't have, you just project them and leave them in, in the world. And you haven't really, we, we don't have a way of thinking about how to collect all of that information and kind of manifest it in a, in a, in a, in a more accurate way. Uh, digital identity is part of this, and, and how do you authent authenticate things? It's going to get harder, um, and so on. All right, so I think there's, there's a lot here to unpack. Um, I think it's important that we think of, of sharing your data with somebody or some party as granting them the right to use it in a whole bunch of different ways. And we need better policies for that kind of thing. This matters in social records and so on. And uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. There's, there's you know, lot, a whole bunch of other pieces of things to think about. Um, the thing I will say is, relative to the last talk, we need to scale these systems to be able to actually deal with the data volumes and, data, uh, and operation accesses that the normal centralized cloud does. And that, that is so far away from where we are today in, in, in the blockchain world. Um, and I'll, I'll make a commitment, like a firm commitment, to the, to the CryptoKitties group that we'll be working hard to solve that problem for you. Uh, it might take us a while, but, but we are committed to, to, to solving it. Um, and meanwhile, as, as the space uh, that we're part of you know, kind of goes through highs and lows and so on. Just remember, this is, happens every time there's a technological revolution. There's a lot of excitement, a lot of hopes, a lot of promise. Some of those hopes and promise don't, don't materialize. So just keep calm and build a spaceship. All right, thank you.